Nothing recalls the medieval era in Europe better than the image of a gallant knight in shining armor mounted on a fully barred, or armored, steed. But how effective was such male horse armor in protecting the horses in battle? What was the thickness of such armor? In what circumstances did heavy cavalry regiments, as cavalry regiments mounted on armored horses were known, play important combat roles? A new study published in Exarch Journal has set out to answer some of these pragmatic questions away from the romantic tales of medieval chivalry. In a historical, pre-motorization context, mounted armies have had the advantage of speed, mobility and greater height over foot soldiers. They could be light cavalry used for reconnaissance, screening and harassing or heavy, armored, cavalry used for shock attacks. During the late Middle Ages as armor for knights became more effective, their horses were targeted by arrows shot from longbows. The dismounted knights were then picked out and dispatched by armored infantrymen. Horse armor developed in response. Medieval armor consisted of thick quilted fabric, typically linen, covered with metal rings that were linked together to form a mesh called chain mail. Eventually, steel plates were added on top of the mail. Such armor was heavy and European horses were bred for increased size and strength just so that they could carry the burden of their own armor and of their armored knight into battle. But, was a horse carrying such a heavy burden effective in long-drawn combat? A study by David Jones and Emma Herbert Davies provides the answer, according to Horse Talk. They didn't really have many surviving examples of such armor to study. Medieval European horse armor is mostly known through historical illustrations and documents although complete sets are on display at Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Wallace Collection in London, the Royal Armories in Leeds, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Heavily used in 13th century Europe, specimens that can reliably be dated to that period are almost non-existent. Younger survivors from the 14th century, also very rare, served as the models for the researchers given the absence of the classical examples. Since, it was basically the thickness of the cloth padding that accorded armor protection. In their study of horse armor the researchers experimented with padding of unbleached woven upholstery linen of different amounts of layers. They first determined the maximum thickness that a horse could carry into battle. Simple reproduction bodkin points, square spiked metal arrowheads, were then shot at the various thicknesses to determine relative effectiveness. A longbow made of yew was used to shoot the arrows. The results showed that thickness mattered. Penetration of individual shots under identical conditions was controlled by the numbers of layers. However, a wax coating applied to the arrowhead increased penetration in all cases. Even with 24 layers, the wax-coated arrowhead broke through to the last layer in 8 out of 10 shots. Was it possible then for padded chain mail horse armor to provide complete protection against arrows without overburdening the horse beyond capacity? Apparently not. 24 layers of linen together with chain mail itself would constitute a weight of 54 kilograms or 119 pounds. Add to this a weight of 122 kilograms from a rider weighing 70 kilograms, his armor, saddle and weapons, and the horse would have a staggering weight of 178 kilograms on his back, exceeding his carrying capacity by far. The sensible or pragmatic weight for horse armor for a typical warhorse of the era would be 28 kilograms, according to Jones and Herbert Davies. In addition to the weight, the 19 mm thickness of linen would add greatly to the thermal load on the horse, with a consequent risk of heat stress, they are quoted in horse talk as saying. To use the horse in an all-day battle operation going beyond a 3-8 layer padding under the mail was impractical. These thicknesses would have led to arrow wounds varying in depth from 20 mm to 60 mm. Allow for a thin coating of wax and penetration would have increased by another 20 mm. On the whole, the fully armored medieval warhorse would probably have had a very limited role. The combined effect of weight and thermal loading meant that it could only perform effectively for relatively short periods, they are cited in horse talk as saying. They would have served the knights well in jousting for the hand of a fair maiden, or in rescuing a damsel in distress from the clutches of a fire-breathing dragon. 
They would could even come in helpful if a dastardly knight had locked her up in the topmost tower of his moated castle, or even in tournaments whereby knights tested their skills against each other. But in battle and chevauchee type raiding operations of medieval warfare that required long periods of speed and endurance, male horse armor would have given poor results. The Order of Brothers of the German House of St. Mary in Jerusalem, commonly known as the Teutonic Order, is a military order that was founded in the Holy Land during the Crusades. The Teutonic Order was originally established as a hospice to provide care from pilgrims. It was not long, however, until the order followed in the footsteps of the Templars and Hospitallers and became militarized. Although not as influential as those orders in the Holy Land, the Teutonic Order succeeded in creating an independent monastic state along the Baltic Sea during the Northern Crusades. The Teutonic Order still exists today, though as a charitable rather than a military organization. The origins of the Teutonic Order may be traced back to the middle of the 12th century. In 1143, the Hospitallers were ordered by Pope Celestine II to take over the running of the German hospital in Jerusalem. This hospital had been set up to cater to the pilgrims and crusaders from Germany who were neither able to speak French, the local language, nor Latin. Although the hospital was to be managed by the Hospitallers, the prior and the brothers of the hospitals themselves should be Germans. This arrangement allowed the tradition of a German-led religious institute to develop in the Holy Land. Jerusalem fell in 1187, and the first significant counterattack by the Crusaders against the Muslims was the Siege of Acre, which began two years later. It was during this siege that some merchants from Lübeck and Bremen, inspired by the German hospital, decided to run a field hospital for the duration of the siege. Acre fell to the Crusaders in 1191, and in the following year the field hospital, which formed the nucleus of the new Teutonic Order, was recognized by the Pope, and the monks received Augustinian rule. In 1198, the Teutonic Order became a military order. In 1220, the Knights purchased Montfort, Starkenberg, a castle to the northeast of Acre, and set up their headquarters there. The castle was held by the Teutonic Order until 1271, when it fell to the Mamluks. The prestige of the Teutonic Knights increased under Hermann von Salza, the fourth grandmaster of the Teutonic Order, and a close friend of the Holy Roman Empire Frederick II. When the emperor was crowned as King of Jerusalem in 1225, for instance, the Teutonic Knights served as his escort to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and the Grandmaster read the Emperor's proclamation in both French and German. Nevertheless, the Teutonic Knights were not as influential as the Templars and Hospitallers in the Holy Land. Instead, the Teutonic Order had a much greater impact on Europe, specifically in the region along the Baltic Sea, where they established an independent monastic state during the Northern Crusades. In 1211, Andrew II, the King of Hungary, invited a group of Teutonic knights to defend his Transylvanian borderland from the incursions of nomadic raiders. The knights were given the district of Berzenland to serve as their base. Although they were granted relative autonomy, the Teutonic knights were prohibited from building stone fortifications, as the Hungarians were afraid that they would grow too strong and interfere in the kingdom's politics. Andrew's commands were ignored, but due to the order's effectiveness the king decided to tolerate them. Eventually, however, the knights grew so powerful that the Hungarian nobles became disgruntled, resulting in the knights being expelled in 1225. From Hungary, the Teutonic knights moved to the Baltic, where a new opportunity presented itself. In 1217, Pope Honorius III had called for a crusade against the pagan Prussians, and one of the rulers who responded was Conrad I, the Duke of Masovia. By 1225, the Prussians had gained the upper hand, and were raiding across the northern border of Masovia. In 1226, Conrad appealed to the Teutonic Knights to come to his aid. Von Salza saw Prussia as a perfect training ground for his knights in preparation for further crusades against the Muslims in the Holy Land. But the Grand Master had also learned from his mistake in Hungary and took precaution to prevent its repetition. As a result, 
the golden bowl of Rimini was obtained from the Holy Roman Emperor. Under the bowl, the Emperor acknowledged the order's ownership of the lands granted to them by Conrad, as well as territory that they conquered from the Prussians. The order also obtained the golden bowl of Rieti from the Pope, which placed them under the sovereignty of the Pope, rather than any secular ruler. In about half a century, Prussia was conquered by the Knights and became part of the state of the Teutonic Order. This monastic state lasted until 1525, and during its three centuries of existence it played an important role in the politics of the region. The decline of this monastic state began during the 15th century, when they were decisively defeated by a Polish-Lithuanian army at the Battle of Grunwald in 1410. The order was further weakened by internal conflicts and the Prussians began to revolt against the order. In 1525, the order lost all its Prussian lands, marking the end of the state of the Teutonic Order. However, they still possessed land within the Holy Roman Empire. The Knights continued to play a military role in the Holy Roman Empire until 1809, when the order was dissolved by Napoleon. Nevertheless, the Teutonic Order survived in Austria and became a purely spiritual religious order in 1929. When Austria was annexed by Nazi Germany, the order was abolished, though it survived in Italy. After the war, the Teutonic Order was reconstituted in Germany and Austria, and, by the end of the 1990s, it was transformed into a charitable organization. Due to the popularity of the King Arthur legends, knights and chivalry are often associated with England and France. Yet one of the knights that best embodied knightly virtue is a Polish man named Zawisza Czarny. A local noble from Garbo in modern-day southeast Poland, Zawisza was a valiant soldier, an honorable diplomat, and a man brave enough to stand his ground in the face of certain defeat. Little is known about Zawisza, but researchers from the Institute of History, Maria Curie Sklodowska University in Lublin have embarked on a project to uncover more about the famed Polish knight. Zawisza Czarny was popularly referred to as Zawisza the Black because of his thick, black hair. He apparently enjoyed the moniker because he had a suit of black armor custom built. Today, this can still be seen in Częstochowa, Poland at the Jasna Góra Monastery, which is better known for its famed shrine of the Virgin Mary. Zawisza was probably born around 1379 into a family that bore the Sulima coat of arms of the Slakta, a Polish caste of legally privileged nobles. Records show that in 1397, at the age of 18, Zawisza married Barbara, a woman from a noble family that bore the Palawa coat of arms, another branch of the Slakta. Together, they had four sons. Barbara is well remembered because some believe that it is through her connections that Zawisza gained the attention of the royal court. Barbara was the niece of Pyotr Wysz Radolinski, Bishop of Krakow. Pyotr worked in the court of Queen Jedwiga, better known in Western Europe as Queen Hedwig. Crowned in 1384, Hedwig was the first female monarch of the Kingdom of Poland, a post that she held until her death in 1399 due to complications from childbirth. Hedwig married the Grand Duke of Lithuania Jogaila in 1386 after he converted to Roman Catholicism. Jogaila thus became King the Ladislaw II Jogelo. He served as a co-ruler with Hedwig, although he spent a good deal of time converting Lithuania to Christianity and stamping out the trouble caused by the Teutonic Knights, who felt that the king's conversion was a sham and kept trying to conquer Lithuania with the intention of killing all of the still pagan Lithuanians. Upon Hedwig's death in 1399, King the Ladislaw II Jagiello became sovereign of Poland and commander of Poland-Lithuania until his death in 1434 of a bad cold. During this time, Zawisza Czarny was presumably training as a knight and fighting in tournaments, at which he won much acclaim. The next time Zawisza's name appears in the historical records is at the Battle of Grunwald between Poland-Lithuania and the Teutonic Knights. It was one of the largest battles in medieval Europe and was memorialized by the artist Jan Matejko in his 1878 painting, Battle of Grunwald. It is the image of Zawisza in this painting that is most widely used to depict him. Zawisza served with distinction during the battle, 
which was a resounding success for King the Ladislaw II Jagiello. Zavisha was made a part of the delegation that negotiated a peace deal with Sigismund of Luxembourg, King of Hungary Bohemia, perhaps because of this distinction or his reputation as a superb knight, or his family connections. The deal would become known as the Treaty of Libola. In 1412, Zavisha cemented his place of honor in the eyes of the two monarchs at a tournament held by the Ladislaw II and Sigismund. In all, there were about 1,500 knights there from all over Europe. It was Zavisha who won the tournament. Today, we know him better as the Black Knight who defeated Sir John II of Aragon at the tournament in Perpignan in modern day southwest France. Zavisha continued to fight in tournaments and to serve as a diplomat for the King of Poland for many years. It is through victories in numerous European tournaments, at the turn of the 14th and 15th century that he gained the fame which today the biggest stars of sport and pop culture enjoy. In 1428, Zavisha was called upon to join King Sigismund in his war against the encroaching Ottoman Turks. It proved to be a disastrous expedition. Zavisha fought the Turks at the Siege of Golubac, a fortress on the banks of the Danube in modern-day Serbia. Defeated by the main Ottoman army under Sultan Murad II, Sigismund ordered the retreat back to the Hungarian side of the Danube. Zavisha was in charge of guarding the soldiers and horsemen as they got onto the boats that would ferry them across the river. Legend has it that, when it was time for him to make the crossing, Zavisha Charny was angry the king acted as a coward, and, refused to retreat. Instead he continued fighting, message to Eagle. 2016, it is certain that he died as a result of this decision, however, whether he was killed in combat or was executed later while in Ottoman captivity is not known for certain. We know that he was born there in Garbo and he was proud of his roots. That feeling has subsided despite the meteoric career in medieval tournaments. Whenever he was in Western Europe, he referred to himself as his father and grandfather, of Garbo said Dr. Tomislaw Giorgiel from Institute of History, Maria Curie Sklodowska University in Lublin, leader of the Zavisha research team. The project came about when Dr. Giorgiel realized that, despite the many monuments to Zavisha of Garbo, in the available archaeological documentation from the area of Garbo there isn't a single site from the Middle Ages. In other words, the home of Zavisha's family is missing. There is no castle or mansion or any other indication that a noble family once lived in the area. There had to be a feudal center there, associated with the fact that this was the residence of the Zavisha family, who ruled the land. There had to be rural settlements, insists Dr. Giorgio. His team's search will be complicated by the many Garbos now in eastern Poland including Stary Garbo, Nomi Garbo, and Gmina Garbo. The Zavisha project is still ongoing.